Lord, we thank you that you are mighty, that all things are subject to you. We thank you that the grass withers and the flowers fade, but your word endures forever, that nothing of you will perish, that your kingdom is for all time, that all things made were made by you and nothing has ever been made apart from you and nothing will last apart from you. So now, Lord, we remember your promise, the promise of the covenant, that you yourself will be our teacher, that a man will not instruct his neighbour to know God, but you yourself will cause us to know you, to write your law on our hearts and upon our minds. So we pray, Lord, that you would encamp about your people, that you would pour out your spirit in our hearts and our minds and our understanding to open to us, Lord, to light up to us, Lord, the meaning of the scripture so that we might be washed clean by your word, by the water of your spirit, by your very presence with us, to sanctify us, to set us apart as a people holy to you, to set us apart for the good things prepared in advance for us to accomplish in your name, for your glory, Lord, for the rescue of the, your people, especially those, Lord, who are alone, who are afraid, who are oppressed, who are in any way, Lord, unable to help themselves lord we ask that you would empower us to help them lord not because we are greater better or in any uh, any less need than them but lord that we want to be in agreement with you about them and about each other with all this in mind lord we turn now to your word and pray for your help amen man please take a seat so just before we come and sit um just before we start, can we just, uh, we were going to have some visitors tonight from some Moriel people from Upper Hut, but Steve, who's a lovely, lovely guy, he has to feed through a, like a feeding tube with a, all his food is like baby food in a bag because he has a surgery, he's left him unable to eat properly. And he's really poorly today, like he's like really, really poorly today. So can we just spend a moment um, to pray for Steve and Mel and the family, just that the Lord would intervene, you know, ideally to heal, but if not to heal, at least to bring, you know, his peace and, uh, yeah, assurance to them. So perhaps just if you each, um, so Mel and Steve and the family, just pray quite silently to yourself. If we just bring your petitions to the Lord for them. I know you don't know them, but trust me, if you did, you would be praying for them. Okay, and they want, they really want to come and share with us, but it's very hard for him to travel. He's normally hooked up to a machine. So it's not easy for him to. So um, just for, uh, you know, say a minute, Mel and Steve and the family. Okay, thank you for that. Um, hopefully you will get to meet them, they're really super cool Samoan family but they've really been through the mill and they really love the Lord a great deal so yeah hopefully we'll get to meet them yes yeah we all believe that God answers prayer mm. no one dare doubts that but how many of you have actually really seen very specific prayer answers a few of you have, most of you haven't. I had one to win this last week, um, one of four requests that I had made to my Heavenly Father regarding my family, um, which I prayed it, but I don't really believe it would happen. <laughs> um, no, faith. But I, won't, I can't share the nature of it, but <clears throat> it was enough that captured my attention and I reconfirmed it. Um, in another way this week um, but these were four very specific things regarding my family which spread over a number of years and I was very I had to make sure that this, these were the things that our, our father would, would likely to answer now remember what I shared with you about praying in Jesus' name. That's mm -hmm. not a, you don't make a request and have this magic incantation at the end. Mm. Some of you are still falling back into that pattern. Um, but saying in Jesus' name, amen, is not praying in his name. It's just, that's just a magical formula that we have learned to do out of tradition. 
But when you understand that the Father's nature and his character, what he desires, we can pray according to that. And we can see it. Now, it didn't happen, up, happen overnight for me. It happened over a number of years. <coughs> but the fourth one happened yesterday, yesterday, about a week ago. <coughs> and then it got reconfirmed again this week. So think about how you pray, how, what you ask for. Don't make it into a formula. Just know, you, know the heart of your Heavenly Father and what He's likely to do for you, and then ask according to that. <coughs> awesome. Okay, so tonight is a bit of a recap because we're working our way through First John. But I really felt to like slow down and back up a bit to part of what we did last week. Because of some things that have happened in the world and with people I know, and it's like, you know, sometimes you take the hint from the Lord that this is something he really wants us to really, really understand because if we don't, will be vulnerable to what's happening. So uh, hopefully I can manage to make sense because it's a subject that while actually astonishingly simple is almost completely not understood in the church. It baffles me as to why, but there you go. So hopefully by the end of the night we'll have a much clearer view of a couple of things. That what Wayne just shared, can I, it sort of ties in a bit to this, so can I just expand slightly? When you pray in the name of the Lord, what, why do we say that? It's because of what Jesus said, isn't it? Can anyone give me, never mind the scripture reference, what did Jesus say that has us doing that? If you ask anything, isn't it? Anything. Now it sounds like he means if you ask anything. Right, but you have to remember it's he's a Hebrew speaking to Hebrews. Okay, the key is what he says next in my Shem, yes. and so in English we say name, in the Hebrew it's Shem. Okay, so you know how the Jews won't pronounce the name of God, they say Hashem, the name, as if the name was a person. Well, it is a person, you know, so Shem, name. But it doesn't mean, well, who can tell me? Because I've said this before, who remembers what it means? Character. That's different character. Yeah, it's not just your handle. It's not just like Rainiel or Warwick. It's not just your name tag. It's everything that is you. So the easiest English word is character, which includes, or uh, the full description of you, which of course includes your handle, you know, Rainier or Warwick, but that's just one minor piece of it. It's much more embracing. So what he's saying is, anything that you ask in my character, I will do. So he could say, putting words in his mouth, which is always dangerous, but you could say that he's saying, if I was here to do it in person, I would do it. You know, so if I would do it in person, I will do it through you. So if it's out of character with him, don't wait for that prayer to be answered, or at least don't wait for him to answer it the way you want it to be answered. Because sometimes he answers all right, but to teach you a lesson, <laughs> you know. So if you want authoritative prayer, if you want to pray authoritatively, then you have to pray in the in the in agreement with his character. You know, so if someone really offends you and you just hate them so much, you say, "In Jesus' name, drop dead." Are they going to drop dead? Why? Because if Jesus was there, he wouldn't say that. He wouldn't. You know, it's out of character. God will not answer that though you have put in Jesus' name on the end. As Wayne said, it's not a magic kind of incantation that, that just makes any, whatever you said first suddenly happen. But sadly, many churches talk as if it was. You know, They think that whatever you stick in Jesus' name on the end means it has to happen. Mm. Utter nonsense. Okay, so if you want effective prayer, you need to know him. Because if you don't know him, if you don't know his character, you won't know 
how he would respond because what he's asking for is that you agree with him about it because the other pre thing that people get wrong with prayer anyone want to confess to a one minute prayer when you're alone with the Lord that your one minute prayer finishes about an hour later we go on and on and on at him how much more yeah how much more do you think he understands your request at the end of the hour than at the beginning <laughs> not not any extra why because he understood it perfectly before you opened your mouth okay so one of the things for effective prayer is beginning with the understanding that you don't have to explain why do you think people do rabbit on any idea well because they think they should be heard for their many words. Oh, I'm talking about in private. That is true if we're talking so about in public. But there's a real reason. You know what? Trying to persuade. Sometimes, but trying to persuade who? Yes. God. Who said yourself? Oh. Yes. Because often, long, windy prayers are because I'm not really sure what it is that I need. I don't understand what's wrong. So you start off what you think it is and then the more you pray the more things occur and it just goes off in a big lazy circle you know and actually what you really need was the much shorter prayer which is lord i don't understand what's happening i need wisdom i need you to instruct me and to lead me and to bring me into agreement with you about whatever that is that's happening you understand because we have a tendency to belittle God in our prayers and treat him as if he will be able to answer when he finally understands what I'm asking. You know, thankfully he's inordinately patient. Very patient. How can you tell? I'm still here. <laughs> you know? Okay, so anyway, that will, those things will tie in a little bit with what we're talking about. So tonight is a bit of a recap about some of the things we've done in the first two parts. The things that John has to say in his first epistle. So just going back and recapping, remember John makes it very clear to us that he's speaking of someone who was instructed by the Lord face to face. The reason this is so important and will become more important as time goes on is that what's happening in the church is that people are saying, oh, we have to go back to this and we have to go back to that and whatever. But none of them are actually saying you have to go back to the word. Some want to go back to the desert fathers, you know, the origins of the Catholic Church, and that that's like 300 years after Christ. Others want to go back to John Calvin, 1500. Others want to go back to this thing or that thing. None of those people that they want to go back to were instructed by Jesus face to face but god gave us the scripture so that you can hear from not only his son but also the apostles the disciples of his son who were instructed in person face to face by god so the reason things like the epistles are so important is that's what you're reading you're reading the testimony of someone who was taught in person by the lord do you see the difference when it comes to the crunch and th remember more and more deception is going to come into the world and is already that's happening at an alarming rate don't you want the solid ground under your feet so more and more we have to push past all the whatever is becoming popular in the church or whatever and make sure that the solid ground we are standing on is the testimony of those who received it firsthand it's not second-hand understanding. Does that make sense? And we have looked in the last couple of weeks at the theme, the, the theme of his first part, which is we have to do what? We have to walk in the light as he is in the light. What does John say about people who don't do that? Remember, if you don't walk in the light as he is in the light, you deceive yourself the truth is not in you 
okay? If the truth is not in you, what else is not in you? Or who else is not in you? What are the names for the Holy Spirit? He is the Spirit of Holiness. He is the Spirit of Truth. If the truth is not in you, the Holy Spirit is not in you either. You're not, you're not born again. You are self-deceived. You think you're a Christian, but you are not. The Spirit in you is something else. That's what John's warning about. Okay, be very clear on that. And we also learned in, the, in our last couple of sessions that how much use is religion to your salvation? By religion, I'm talking about all the trappings. Zero. None. We're going to focus on this a bit more. The labors of the nations are but fuel for the fire. Remember Habakkuk 2. And Matthew 7, remember Matthew 7? Lord, Lord, look at all the things we've done in your name. And what does he say to them? Go away from me. I don't know you. And that I don't know you ties into what John says. If people do not walk in the light of Christ, they, they deceive themselves. And what he says they deceive themselves about is they deceive themselves about knowing him. They think they know him, but they do not. So it's exactly what Jesus says to those people. So this is pretty important, isn't it? You don't want to hear. The last thing you want to hear, or the last thing you want anyone you care about to hear on that day is, go away from me, I don't know you. The fact that they did heaps of works, do they know he's the Messiah? Yes, they're calling him Lord, Lord. Did they do works? Yes, it says, miracles, all kinds of stuff. So they're not kidding, they were busy as. But did it count for anything? No. Why not? As we'll see in a minute, there are works and then there are works. Not every busyness is in Christ. That's what Habakkuk was on about. The labours of the nations, the goyim, are just fuel for the fire. Unless the Lord builds a house, the labourers labour in vain. Okay? So what's this telling you already? Unless you want a futile life, you want to be working with him, not for him. Does that make sense? It's a, it sounds like the same thing, but it really isn't. And you want to make sure the one you're working with is him not a substitute again big on that topic tonight so we're going to be going out of john a little bit to some of the other epistles just to get the supporting because paul and peter they have nothing different to say they're in agreement with john completely though when some people read it you would think they were actually at odds some people can't reconcile them so my purpose tonight to help you understand they're all actually saying the same thing really so who would like to get us rolling with um, Ephesians 2 on page 1 it's very short R Rima would you like to read that for us <coughs> yep So the very first thing that you need for salvation is what? Grace. And it's this word here, charis, okay, from which you get the word charismatic. Can anyone remember from last week, grace, charis, what's the simple, straightforward definition of it? Kindness. Kindness. It is, it is connected to his Shem it is God's kindness and as I put in there it's his it's the part of his character that inclines him towards saving you though there's no legal reason why he should bother with you he is inclined always to try and save you it's just his character so the graciousness of God is his innate overwhelming kindness and mercy 
that though he ought to destroy you for your sin, instead, he's always seeking your salvation. He won't break his own rules. You know, the rules don't change. He doesn't suddenly go soft and decide to save just everyone. But he's always seeking it. Grace. You can't have salvation unless this is present. Without grace, there's no salvation. Which, how would you explain that to someone, or maybe someone who doesn't understand Christianity at all? What would that mean in simple terms? Well, just this. It's God that saves us. Because the, who, who can give God's grace? Only God. It's not your grace. You can't give God's grace. You can be gracious in reflection of him, but you can't give something that belongs to God. Only God can give it. There's no salvation that doesn't begin with him. Okay? So what's the first two things that tells you? How many people can you save in your life? Easy answer. How many? Zero. Zero. Why? Because no one can save their neighbour. Because you can't do that. You can assist in someone's salvation. In fact, it's critical that you do. But you can't make another person saved. You can't give in the absence of God. Right? So the first thing is that all your religious works are in the same category. Without the grace of God making something happen, you can be as religiously busy as you like and it will add up to nothing. Right? What's the second thing is you can't save yourself either. He has to save you. So when people think that they can get by because of their own righteousness, you know, I'm a good person. You know, I'll be going to heaven. I'm a good person. I've got nothing to deal with. Do you know anyone that has nothing to deal with that would keep them out of heaven? There's no one. All have sinned. All fall short. Not one is righteous, as the scripture says. Okay? So, apart from his kindness, charis, grace, nothing can happen. The best you could hope for is to be just another painful religious person clattering around with your incense and your funny hat. You know? That's it. Jesus backs us up himself. John 6 verse 44. Holly, do you want to read that for us? No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up to the last day. So that no one, odious in Greek, means zero people. No one, it's not a trick thing. No one means how many? None. How many people can come to Jesus unless the Father draws them by the Holy Spirit? Zero. So if you are witnessing or evangelizing, whatever, how come everyone doesn't just hear and straight away come running and everyone gets saved? It's simple. Unless he is in it. You can bang on all day. No one is able to come to Jesus unless the Father sends the Holy Spirit to get them. Has anyone been saved a short enough time to sort of still remember the process? Actually, everyone here was born in a Christian family probably. So I'll talk about people I know who are maybe in gangs or things like that, you know, and then suddenly a weird thing happens to them. And they all say the same thing. A weird thing happens to them. They suddenly start thinking about God for no accountable reason, you know? And these can be pretty wild people. And suddenly they can't get God, and not any God, God, God. They can't get him out of their head. And then suddenly, though they might have no Christian friends, suddenly Christians appear in their life. And they start hearing things that maybe they've heard before, but they never heard it. But all of a sudden, it goes in. And all of a sudden, they find this. They are being drawn. They literally have to come and find out. That is what Jesus is talking about. When the Lord sets out to save someone, that's how it starts. He goes to get them. 
this actually goes back to Ezekiel 34, my favorite scripture at the moment. But so he sends his servant to get a bride for his son from Genesis 24, if you remember that, when Abraham wants a, a bride for Isaac. The servant is who? It's Rakh HaKodesh. That person can have heard the gospel a thousand times before, but all they would have heard is a person talking. Unless the spirit is there and God has them in his sights at that particular juncture of their life, why isn't it just all the time? Any guesses? Why isn't the spirit there constantly for everyone all the time? Any idea? We can't say categorically. Anyone have any ideas? Why isn't he drawing everyone all the time? Any ideas? Well, a person has to be at the place God knows he needs them to be before they'll hear him. Some people will come easily and he'll draw them when they're children. Other people need to be broken, so he'll wait till they're in jail or in the alcohol rehab or the divorce court or whatever. My friend Rochelle and I went to a cafe one Friday night and she had amazing discernment. Like there's a big radar dish turning on her head, she could spot someone God wanted to talk to <coughs> a thousand yards. And there's a guy sitting by himself in the cafe nice looking guy sitting there by himself and she said to me oh, just pray because I have to go and talk to that guy and I'm like do you and she said mm, I do wait here so off she went and she plonked herself down in front of him all cheerful and said hi I'm Rochelle I want to talk to you about Jesus she was very direct and he didn't look very happy <laughs> as some people don't but she wasn't going to be put off and she just said to him God wants you, and whatever's just happened in your life, it matters to him. Well, that did it. He burst into tears. You know what happened? He'd been married two days before, and the day before, one day after he was married, the wife ran off with the best man. His best friend ran off with his new... I mean, they could have at least had the decency to run off before the wedding. So imagine how devastating that is. So now someone wants to come along and tell you that Jesus loves you and everything's going to be great. Wouldn't you want to just punch that person right in the nose, probably? You know? God, you bastard, you know? What have you done to me? That's the usual thing, right? Except, it's called the eklentos, the presence of the Spirit, was there really powerfully. Because what came out of Rochelle's mouth was really what God meant. It mattered to him what had happened. But that guy... He was a professional, he made prosthetic limbs at the hospital, you know? So he was very clever, highly trained, highly educated, <coughs> wealthy, you know, like, so in human terms, who's cruising? So why would he need Jesus, you know? God waited until something he knew that this wicked world was going to do to him. That was God's moment to say, hi, I'm here. So he listened patiently to Rochelle, who was good at like Sunday school level, but when he had those kind of questions, she's going. <laughs> so she, they used to call us the feather and the axe. <laughs> she would tickle them, and then when the tricky questions, she'd call for the axe, you know. <laughs> but I just gave him the matter of fact answers. I said, Ask me anything, I'll tell you the truth, then go away and think about it. And um, that next Sunday we're sitting in church and who should walk in but this guy came and sat with us and he said that very night when he went home and he had his mouth full of toothpaste and his toothbrush in his mouth and he just thought in his head he said Jesus if you're real you better show me and he said there was a huge flash of light and it's like literally like the veil was parted you know, he went from not knowing to having faith, certainty, in literally like a flash of light. Because in that moment, he met, the Holy Spirit was drawing him, and he said, well, if you're there, I'm coming. Boom. You know, got saved. 
probably got saved from a crazy woman and got saved for eternity as well. But God had to be in it. If that, you tried to do that and the Lord was not there to do those sort of things, he would have just told someone the next day, oh, I met a couple of real weirdos in the cafe last night talking about some Jesus guy, whatever. You see the difference? Anyway, the look up Genesis 24 when you get home or when you're doing your review because this tells you the pattern of how all this works. Jesus is not making anything up. He's drawing on something the Jews already understood. If you're a girl and... Oh, sorry, if you're a guy and you wanted to get married in old Hebrew culture, who primarily would decide who you should marry? Your dad, right? And at the very least, even if you had an idea, if he didn't approve, not happening. So we get a hangover of that, well not so much today, but those of us of a certain age would remember that you could never hope to get married unless you had her, if you're a guy, you could never hope to get married unless you had her dad's approval, right? If you didn't have the approval of the parents, just forget it. So that's a hangover from that thing. But it's not arranged marriage like in India or whatever. The key thing is the girl would be, the families would agree, everything would be agreed, and then they would ask the girl herself. What happened if she said no? It doesn't happen. doesn't happen. It's just off. There's no coercion. So in the Hebrew system, the father did the choosing. He'd say, I think this is the girl for you. If the families agreed and everything else, so they would make sure everything was good, and then they would ask her. But if she said no, that's it. Scrub mission. It's just over. Free will. There's no coercion. Okay, so what happens when Abraham wants a son for Isaac? Can anyone remember? He sends his oldest servant, his most faithful servant. So for God the Father, who would that be? It's the Spirit. He sends him to his own people to get a wife. And the servant says, how will I know which one she is? Well, imagine you're on that mission. You know? Imagine, Holly, that your dad, or that Jerry said, Go and get a wife for Joseph. <laughs> go back, go back to Bulacan and bring back a wife for Joseph. And you went there and you went into the church and discovered that there was more than one unmarried girl. There's like, you know, a thousand. What do you do? Well, this is the dilemma of the servant. <laughs> you know? But he says, don't worry, God will send an angel ahead of you and give you a sign. You will know which one it is, right? But even then, he, he says, the servant says to him, but what if she refuses to come? And Abraham says to the servant, you must pledge to me that you will bring her back. But if she refuses, I release you. From your vow okay so the holy spirit will never force someone to be saved because genesis 24 shows you the pattern of how it works so he knows who to go and get he knows who the father wants for his son remember where the bride he's looking to betroth that person to christ but if she on invitation puts her foot down and says no way it's off okay it's off that's why do you ever wonder why jesus god in person preached and did miracles in front of so many people but so few became his disciples why didn't he just you know he could raise the dead he could turn water into wine why didn't he just do like benny hen or something cup up and go zap you're a christian and zap you're a christian oh you look nice we'll have you as well thanks that because it's not how God's Shem is. I always say to people, who's going to be in heaven? Those who want to be there. God will not force anyone into his kingdom. He wants with him for eternity those who want to be there. Understand? So free will is a big thing. 
And we won't, so read that story for yourself. It's very instructive, but it's teaching you about how that initial salvation process works. Okay? Why does, the, why does, do you anyone remember the wife's name? Rivka, Rebecca. Okay? What does she say to the servant when she agrees? Has she ever met Isaac? No? What does she know about him? Only what the servant was able to tell her. Okay? Have you ever met Jesus? No? What do you know about him? Only what the servant has made known to you. The spirit. But she went because she trusted God in the process. She didn't need to see Isaac. She knew God's hand was in it. She trusted his choice. Okay? So we're like that. We haven't seen Jesus face to face, but we trust that we could not have a better husband. So we go home with the Spirit to him. That's what's happening to you now. You're on the way back in that sense. Okay? Anyway, all the way through, it begins with grace. God at the beginning, if he's not there at the beginning doing the drawing, it's not real salvation. Can you have a fake salvation? Yes, you can. What would that look like? Well, it would look like where you went to some youth rally or something, and you had a really charismatic leader, and he promised you bubble gun and popcorn for the rest of your life, if you just join this church and go to this youth group, blah, 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 and it's fun and the music's good and, 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 and you say, I'm a Christian because it's a Christian group, you know. And, and all the while, God's not in that because they're not actually giving you the gospel, you know. So you've joined something that calls itself Christian, but it's not. But you've joined it. So you've put that label on thinking that's what it means. You understand? But the process, the only process that God has prescribed has not happened. So you haven't joined Jesus, you've joined a club or an organisation or a, some charismatic leader or whatever. So yes, it's very, very easy to have a false conversion. Well, actually, no conversion at all, but you know, you can think that you become a Christian, but actually you haven't encountered Christ at all. Okay? So once again, do you want the fake thing or the real thing? Do you want that for your neighbor? Do you want your neighbor to have the fake thing or the real thing? Well, about you, but I want my neighbor and my friends and even my enemies to have the real thing. Because if they don't have the real thing on the day, there's no getting in. Let's go over to page two. There's a bit more on page one you can read for yourselves later. So let's remind ourselves what John has to say. 1 John 2 verse 3 from last week. We know that we have come to know him. How? If we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but doesn't do what he commands is a liar and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. And this is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. So let's just back up a second. Remember what we're talking about Matthew 7? You know, when he says, depart from me, I don't know you. This is what John is emphasizing here. If you, if you are not organizing your life to be in obedience to his commands, you are deceiving yourself about being Christian. And you don't know him. That's the deception that John's talking about. You think you know him, but you don't. Your belief that you know him is false. And that's what Jesus is saying in Matthew 7. All these people coming up thinking they know him, but actually they've never had a genuine relationship with the real Jesus at all. So what Jesus have they had a relationship with? Well, just one of the endless list of substitutes. You know, the list is never ending and grows by the week. Does it matter which false Jesus you follow? No. The only thing that matters about it is that you're following a false one. Doesn't matter which false one. What do you need to be saved? Relationship with the real one. How many messiahs do we have? one how many characters does he have one 
Does it ever change? No. You understand? You have to be after the real thing. That word there, it says, whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Now, this word here, aphelio, aphelio, which gets translated as must, if you read that in English, it sounds a bit like a kind of military command, isn't it? You know, like, or, or, or a traffic rule, you know, you must be exactly like him. It's a not particularly good translation. This word here means that you are obligated. Can anyone tell me what obligated means? What is an obligation? A debt has to be paid. It's like a debt. You owe it. If you have an obligation, it's something you owe. So let's read it that way, that verse 6 there in bold. Whoever claims to live in him owes it to Jesus to live as he did. Do you understand? It's an obligation. It's a sense of duty, a sense of debt. Hey, Pete. Are there any? Oh, you've got one? Yeah. It's just, you know, it's not, so it's a sense your attitude should be of someone who is indebted. Now, since we talked about prayer earlier, when you pray, we're told that you're supposed to have something associated with that prayer constantly. Prayer and, starts with T, prayer and thanksgiving. If you're not giving thanks, something's wrong okay that attitude of thanksgiving is uh, is related to this sense of obligation if you are thankful that is consistent with you feeling that you have a debt of gratitude to Christ you owe it to him to be Christian so it's not the kind of debt like you have to your bank you know that you'd like to get rid of those sort of debts, you can't wait to be rid of them, right? They're not a good thing that you want to cling to and treasure. It's the kind of debt to like someone who saved your life. You know, so it's a precious thing. So you feel obliged because what they've done is precious to you that you are thankful for. Okay, so with that in mind, that's what verse 6 is trying to say. This is how we know we are in him that if we claim to live in him we have to have this attitude of thankful indebtedness to him how thankful well the kind of thankful that's willing to put up with anything to be his disciple because how much did he give up for you everything can you imagine ever doing ever suffering anything for christ that would come even part way to where the debt was paid where what he'd paid for you was less than what you'd paid to be his disciple it ain't happening is it ever is this making sense so what's the first clue i've given you it's to do with the attitude of your heart not outward works it's to do with the attitude of your heart the real disciple is the one whose motivation in here is a sense of obligation a, a happy kind of duty where you want to you want to be Christ-like you want to be like him you are out of gratitude out of a sense of you know there's a debt to repay but not like a you know not like the bank kind of debt the, the sort of debt that's valuable that you want to embrace does that make sense it's such an important thing but no one ever talks about it anyone not understand because it's so critical I'll back up if I need to no okay we have to we have to understand what the church tends to preach that fails to grasp this and it goes like this and it, it used to be it used to be in just some denominations but now basically you find this one place or another threaded through everywhere so forget the difference between catholics and protestants or Baptists and Lutherans, just forget all that because it no longer matters, it's everywhere, right? It's just a general problem. And it goes like this. Jesus loves you, yes or no? Yes. yes. And he died for our sins? Yes. yes. And he has, he has 
washed away all your unrighteousness? What's the answer? The answer is maybe. Because that dreaded word if is there. The first two things are absolutely universally true. But John has just finished telling us that unless we walk in the light, unless our heart attitude is this sense of, you know, indebtedness, obligation, then we cannot have assurance that we are in that happy state where his sacrifice is effective for us. Because unless you're in the relationship, you can be deceiving yourself that you're a Christian. You understand? But the church doesn't tell you this. So they, they just assume it in a global sense. You understand? So they'll have people believe that their sins are forgiven, that they, you know, it's all tick, 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 because of what Jesus did, as if nothing you did would have any impact. And if you get to very reformed or Calvinist churches, as we've talked about, remember Tulip and the things we... Don't want to go back over all that, but if you get to that kind of extreme end of the scale, well, they make a profession out of <clears throat> insisting that nothing you could do could have any impact because Jesus has done this and that's it, job done, finished, you are saved, boom, full stop. Nonsense. Scripturally speaking, nonsense, because you'd have to cut John out of your Bible and throw that away, then you'd have to cut Paul out of your Bible and throw that away, because none of them say that, as you've just seen. Okay, so the danger is of falling into this lazy understanding that lures people into thinking that they are safe to go on living any old how because Jesus loves me and you can't argue with that because it's true because he died on the cross for me and you can't argue with that because it's true but where it all falls off the rails is where they are convinced that therefore regardless of what I do now He's just going to save me. And if you get the, you know, the churches that like the nice music and they bring the house lights down and, you know, like a rise or whatever, hill song. And they make it almost like a romantic love with Jesus. What's wrong with that? Based on feelings and sentiment. That's part of it. There's another thing. Remember, it's all about, it all hangs on the genuine Shem, the real character of the real Jesus, right? When I say Jesus loves you, what do you think the attitude of his heart is? Put it in human terms. We'll ask a parent. So I know it's inconceivable to imagine, but you have to imagine that faith ever misbehaved. You know, was there ever a time where you probably would quite like to have given her a real spanking or maybe tossed her out of the house, but you didn't because something stronger made you want to fix her instead. Every parent experiences that, isn't it? What stops you doing what your emotive response would prefer? It's agape love. It's angry. It hates what you've done. It hates what you have become. It hates what you are. It would like to destroy it because it's loathsome and it could destroy it if you're a god but something greater than that base reaction to your sin holds sway it says in the scripture mercy triumphs over justice justice would have you getting a spanking justice would have you tossed out of the house mercy says i'd rather fix you if i can if you agree to be fixed agape love says I'd rather save you if you'll agree to be saved. Okay? So when, when we say Jesus loves us, it's true, but he's not in some kind of romantic obsession with you. Do you think he's deceived or, or blinded for a second <coughs> by misty-eyedness because he's so emotionally overwrought with the happy news that Wayne loves him? <gasps> Thank God! Oh, I've been praying for so long that Wayne would see me. Oh, I can go on holiday now. Rubbish, no. You know, when Jesus looks at Wayne or me or Ben, what does he see? He laughs at Well, that's right. <laughs> that's not thunder, that's God laughing. You know, he sees a sinner. 
God sees clearly. Right? So his love for us is not that kind of schoolboy crush thing. Not at all. But if you go to Hillsong or Rise something, you might imagine that it is. That he's desperate, desperate for your love back. How does that make you picture him? A bit feeble. That he's desperate Dan, like the guy with no girlfriend, hoping that you'll be it. You know, but that's how they portray him in church. So suddenly, where is the need to repent? Where is the fear of the Lord that's the beginning of wisdom? Where is any sense of gratitude, indebtedness for what he's done that would have you pay any price to be Christ-like? You understand? The, what they teach actually disarms people or robs them of the proper relationship by making it out that God is like some big schoolboy desperate for a friend. It's making sense? It's such a problem. And they don't talk about repentance and God knows they don't talk about obedience because that would, you know, they wouldn't have so many people sat down in their church if they talked about you having to do something. But you do have to do something. That's what John says. And he was taught face to face. Don't believe me, believe John. And one of the things they like to preach is that all you need is grace. That salvation is by grace. Full stop. Finish. And if you mention works or obedience, what do they do? They say, oh, you're being legalistic. You're a Pharisee. Blah, blah, blah. Lots of versions of that. Okay, but what's the truth? Well, let's find out. Who knows who James is in the scripture? The epistle of James. So it says he's a brother of the Lord, right? So again, someone who knows him face to face. So you think he knows what he's talking about? I should think so. Let's look what James has to say. Ben, would you like to honour us with that one? What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. Is that unclear in any way? Faith without action, without work, deeds, is what, according to James? It's nothing. Well, it's something, it's just what? It's just belief, isn't it? And a really good object lesson for us, if you don't know this already, take note, read James 10 times before going to bed. If you see someone in need, particularly if the Spirit prompts you, gives you a jab, and you just say, oh, God bless you, Jesus loves you, you should come to my church. You could sit next to, well, not me, but someone I know, you know, and then you go off. How Christ-like is that? What good is that faith? According to James, worthless, worthless. What's better? Who serves God? Someone who does that or an unbeliever who comes up and, and says, are you hungry? Wait there, I'll buy you a sandwich. Which one served the Lord? The last one. You understand? Faith without deeds is nothing but just belief. And I know we've said this a thousand times, but what's another proof from the scripture that just believing Jesus is the Messiah doesn't make you saved? Even the demons know that he is God and tremble. Remember when Jesus gets out of the boat coming across the lake and legion, they're representing, well, a legion is at least a thousand troops in the Roman army, so, that, so he's speaking on behalf of at least a thousand demons. And what does he say? You, know, you think a thousand demons, that's a force to be reckoned with, yes? But what's his attitude when Jesus steps out of the boat? He's quaking with fear, and out of his mouth comes, what? Jesus, Son of the Most High God, what do you want with us? 
Well, there's no doubt that Legion knows without any doubt how much faith does Legion have that Jesus is the Messiah? 100%. No question, right? Are those demons saved? Not at all. So it doesn't matter where you go in scripture, it's the same thing. Just believing that Jesus is the Messiah is only part of what you need. It is not the answer to salvation. Again, coming back to what the churches preach, what do they tell you? If you just believe and confess with your mouth, you'll be saved. They're quoting the scripture, but they're changing what the scripture means. Because Jesus just met with a demon who believes he's the Messiah and confessed with his mouth. Right? I know it's slightly off topic, but does anyone have a stab in the dark? What does that scripture actually mean then? Because it says that. If you believe... If you believe in your, in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, I think it is, then you will be saved, right? It says that, literally. So we know it can't mean what we were just talking about. What can it mean then? What on earth can it mean? Well, the only way you'll understand it is if you remember it's a Hebrew book. And in, and in Hebrew understanding, what dictates what comes out of your mouth? Your heart. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Right? What that means is sooner or later, who you are inside will become obvious by your speech and your action. You know? That's basically what it means. So if you believe in your heart, what does that mean? We're going to break the sentence down. If you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, what does that mean? That means who you are inside has to have come to biblical faith. Therefore, what comes out of you ought to be the reflection of that faith. If you reach that condition, then yes, you're a Christian. You understand? That's what it's trying to say. That Christ-likeness ought to radiate out of you on account of who you are inside has come to be really his. It doesn't mean what the church tries to make it mean, which that you can get someone who's not heard the gospel at all at some Elam meeting like I used to go with my friend and watch in amazement as people had heard one sermon, usually about tithing or some completely pointless thing. And then there'd be an altar call and they'd just have to go and say the little sinner's prayer. You know, oh Jesus, I believe that you're the Messiah, please come into my life, something like that. And they'd think that's it. They've never, they haven't got the gospel, they don't know him. You know, but they think that's it. And when you think you've got it already, what do you stop doing? You stop looking for it you think you've already got. Don't you? And then a couple of weeks later, they've disappeared. You don't see them again. Because it wasn't real. It wasn't real. Back in Ephesians 2, which you can just look back on the, the front page if you want, it says that we are saved through by grace through faith this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can base. This word works is a word ergon. Okay, and you've all, you should all know this word because it's in English. Okay, ergon means to work and it has a particular meaning. It means to do the work in order to satisfy the desire that's within you. Okay, so it's to do useful work, not just to be a slave or whatever. And there's another word for the word economic is Greek, right? So if you want to work efficiently, if you want your work to be economic, very efficient, to get the goal that you want in the smoothest, most economic way, what would you call that? You would call it ergon work, econ economic, or ergonomic. Ergonomic. You all heard that word. So you've come across ergon before. You know, someone designs a better tool and they say it's more ergonomic. That's what they mean. It works more efficiently. So you all know this word, ergon. 
But its meaning is, and this is the bit I want you to hold, it's not just any idea of just general work. It's work that's driven by a desire to satisfy a desire that's within. Okay, so it's work with a goal. Can I put it that way? Work with a goal. Work because you after something. And this becomes important when we look at the meaning of these things. So I now just want to come back to this problem with the, the bad way that church talks about these things and look at a particular misunderstanding. And to do that, we're going to pop into Galatians. Now, churches that love the grace only message, what's the attraction of salvation just being by grace and you don't have to do anything? What would make that popular with churches, especially popular with preachers who want big churches? No effort. No effort. You know, why is it attractive? Because it doesn't require anything of me. And if I am getting paid out of the tithes, you know, I don't, I, you know, I don't take any money for, anyway. But if I was one of those guys, and you know, my riches were go, were driven by the tithes, what do I want in the church? Lots of people, yeah. So am I inclined, <laughs> probably, to tell the truth, or maybe a version of it that might be more attractive to more people to come to my church, pay more tithes, and have a bigger car? This is what happens in the real world. That's where this stuff comes from. Human greed and whatever gets in, muddles things. And next minute, the message has been adapted to suit, right? Let's start with the straightforward thing. Salvation is not by grace alone. What did Ephesians say? Have a look on page one again. You are saved by grace. What does it say next? Through faith. What does through faith mean? Well, it means process. Salvation is not a moment in time. It's not an event. It is a process. Okay? There is a time when you're absolutely not saved, and then there is an event that begins the process by which your salvation will, in due course, become complete. Okay? But it's not like you're fully unsaved and then bang, fully saved. No, nowhere in the scripture does it say that. <clears throat> nowhere. I had an argument once with a guy in the church about that very point. Yep. He could not understand. Even the scriptures clearly states that it shows you there's a process. Yep. He thinks unless you're fully saved, you can't be saved. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it's, just, it, it, it's this muddleness in his mind. One of the things I'll say is you're a new creation, right? Now, these guys over here are going to graduate. Yes, yes. At the moment, what are you? Right now, what are you both? You are students. You know, you're undergrads, you're students, right? There's going to be an instant of time when you are no longer that. When they give you the funny hat and the bit of thing, then what are you? You are graduates, right? But does that mean you are an accountant yet? or uh, you know IT whatever you know not yet but the process where you've you're no longer a student and the process where you are at last really going to become that began at that instant you understand so you really are instantly a new thing you stop being a student you became a graduate so in that sense you are already a new creation but you are not yet completely what you are going to be. And that is how it is with Christianity. You stop being unsaved like a person who's outside the covenant. You are already, straight away, not who you used to be. So you're already a new creation. But that new creation isn't finished. You are not yet who you will be. What do we call that process of remanufacture? sanctification so that's that lifelong wrestling match with your own character <laughs> you know that's God putting on the potter's wheel to make you into a new pot right 
But what they tend to do in the church, the ones that like grace, is they love to go to Galatians and a couple of others. Because here, Paul, especially Paul, he berates believers who are doing a U-turn and going back to trying to be justified before God. What does justified mean in plain English? Forget the big churchy term. If you're explaining it to a child, what would... If I said... Justified never if, if I was trying to be justified in front of my boss at work, what would I be trying to obtain? It's, a, it's like acceptance. It's a bit of a combination of that. If something had happened that he was doubtful about me, like our relationship was maybe lost, but then if I could be get myself justified again in his sight, you know, I'd have the confidence that our relationship is on again, you know, that we're having, we're really having a relationship. It's, it's like that. So whatever might have separated us has been dealt with so that, you know, we can be... It's a bit of a tricky thing to understand, but it's not in itself salvation. It just makes salvation possible. So what happens at the beginning is justification. Because when you're a sinner without Christ, there's no way you can have a relationship with God. You're shut out. So when you first believe and give you, give, you know, enter into that relation, it's they talk about justification having been accomplished by Christ because remember it all starts with him without grace nothing happens justification first then sanctification that's the process of making you so justification is like graduating you know from unsaved to being saved sanctification is where you are transformed over your life from who you, those who've been a Christian a long time, if you can blow the dust off your memory, do you really think you're anything like you were when you were at youth group or whatever? Is your faith now what it was before? No. Why? Because you've been, God's been sanctifying you all this time. You're not a baby anymore. You know? You are really not who you used to be. Does that make sense? So that goes on throughout your life. What happens at the end? What's the last step? Using church speak. Justified, sanctified, there's one last one. Before that, glorification really happens in, in the kingdom. Here I'm talking about. What's the last step on earth? Redeemed. Okay, what does redeem mean? To buy back, to pay off a debt. Okay, so the blood of Jesus pays how much of our debt because of sin? All of it, right? So is anyone here planning to sin next week? No. Nevertheless, is anyone sinning next week? Okay. Because we're human. We're incapable of not sinning, right? So that's why God leaves final redemption as the very last step. Because he, the, if you are really still in covenant with him at your last breath or when the rapture comes, God, God, acknowledges the blood of his son as full payment for your whole debt for your whole life so not just the sin behind you or from before when you were justified but all the sin in your life to the last second that's why he leaves redemption as the last step so justified you were justified you are being sanctified and you will be redeemed if you remain in the covenant with him okay but what they like to do is they go to places like galatians which we'll read in a minute let's read it now who who wants to faith you look so much like you're volunteering i can't overlook you galatians 3 on page 2. you foolish galatians who has bewitched you before whose eyes jesus christ was publicly portrayed as crucified this is the only thing i want to find out from you did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law, or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you, do it by the works of the law, or by hearing with faith? 
So what they like to do is go into scriptures like this and they give it a little twist. And they make it sound that if you're doing any kind of work, you're trying to be justified by something other than faith, right? Because what they really want is they just want to pedal back to this grace only thing where there's, I'm, you know, I'm just saved and I can sit on my deck chair and, you know, nothing I do matters. But we've seen from John that that's just not true. You can be self-deceived about being a Christian. If we're not walking in obedience to him, if we don't have that attitude of obligation to be Christ-like, then it's very, very easy for you to be the first victim of a deception about your own salvation. Paul is not in disagreement with John, so what does he mean? He says, if it's by the works of the law, it can't be by faith, which is it? Well, let's have a look at the structure of this and remind ourselves about one of the tools of Midrash and an ancient... Who, who likes the Psalms? You like the Psalms? Do you notice in the Psalms, uh, do they rhyme? Do the lines rhyme? Is it poetry? It is. Obviously, it's in English, so it wouldn't rhyme in English like it would rhyme in Hebrew. But here's a tip for you. It doesn't rhyme in Hebrew either. But it rhymes to a Hebrew way of understanding. When we, when we do a poem in English, what do we call rhyming? If I have this line rhymes with this line, what do I mean? It sounds the same, you know? So with us, it's about how it sounds to the ear. In Hebrew, two lines rhyme if they use different words but say the same thing, you know? It's not raining, it's sunny. That rhymes in Hebrew. Why? It's two different lines but they say the same thing, okay? So in the Psalms, next time you're reading the Psalms, have a look and you will see that in all the Psalms, they are poems because the Psalmist will say something in a couple of lines and then usually there'll be a bit of a break and then the next few lines will use different words but they'll say exactly what was said before again. And this is how in Hebrew writing, you can tell what the important point is. When they put a Hebrew style of rhyming, in other words, they repeat the same thing but said different ways, in a pattern of repeating, it tells you that that is the key thing in the message. Principle of double ethics. Yeah, okay. Then we have that other tool of Midrash, which is, remember, how, how do I explain what something is? how to make it more clear I also tell you what it's not contrasting right so do I need to explain that to anybody so let's look at the let's look at the example so have a look at Galatians 3 there and you'll see the bits of highlight right did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith What's he doing there? Contrasting two things. Works of the law, hearing by faith. To a Hebrew mind, because it's a, a contrast, it's saying, if it's this, it's not this. If it's this, it's not that. Contrast. So to understand one, you understand the other, and that tells you that this thing is not this thing. Okay? But look what, how it goes on. It says that, then, it says, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? And then it repeats itself. Is it by the works of the law or hearing with faith? This is that poetry thing. The bit in the middle, the works, oh, sorry, having begun with the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh, is actually... The same thing in different words. Works of the law, hearing by faith, by the Spirit, or flesh, works of the law, or by hearing of the faith. All three things, like a, like a Hebrew poem, actually say 
the same thing. It makes the same contrast three times in the space of 10 lines. That tells you that for the writer here, this is, the, this is his big point, right? So let's see what point he's making. Let's start with the first one. Hearing by faith, and this is associated with the spirit, right? Hearing by faith, and then you'll see that second one, that you, are, you got that by the Spirit. Whenever you see the capital S, what does that tell you? Holy Spirit. So, not, so it's not any spirit, it's just a convention in Bible printing to make it clear whether the reference is to the Holy Spirit or just some spirit generally. So whenever it's a capital S, it's always specifically the Holy Spirit. So these things he associates that somehow hearing by faith and being drawn by the Spirit are connected. And this, whoops, get my spelling right, echoe pistis, to hear faith. Can anyone remember, remember we talked about this, this is the Greek word that's translated as faith. Can anyone remember from last week what's special about this? Where does it come from? There's another word. You get a gold star if you remember, or you can read it and cheat. It comes from this word, pithio. And pithio means, and this is really important to remember, to be fully convinced. Okay? So biblical faith is to be fully convinced. But what's special about this word? This is Greek. Its Hebrew equivalent has the same special characteristic. This gets translated as faith. Right? Faithfulness. Faithfulness. What's special about it is there's only one word for faith and faithfulness. And just for the sake of anyone that wasn't here last week, why is that such a big deal? Because if we go back to the Old Testament, like in Habakkuk, the righteous shall be justified by faithfulness. Why is it such a big deal that in both languages, they only have one word for faith and faithfulness? Why is it such a big deal? Sorry? Your yeah, faithfulness is action, but why is it such a big deal that in both languages, they only bother having one word for two things? So just to be clear, by faith we just mean belief. To be fully convinced from Pythio, right? So this is about your mental state. You are fully convinced. You have faith. You are fully convinced. But if we're talking about faithfulness, which has nothing to do with belief, it's to do with action, right? Whether you act faithfully or not. It's the same word. It's no different word. Why is it important? What's significant? Yes, burn this into your head, you know, blazon this into your memory. In both cultures, Greek and Hebrew, it was inconceivable to say that someone had faith if there was no evidence of it being their faithfulness. They would just call you a liar or a hypocrite. Without the evidence of faith, the faithfulness, no one would believe that you had faith, no matter what you claimed. Remember what John is talking about? People, if they don't obey, they deceive themselves. You know, their faith is just a myth. They think they have faith, they do not. If they're not walking in obedience, if the faithfulness is missing, the faith isn't real. There's another even scarier version of that, and this is it. They can be faithful based on a wrong faith. They can be faithful to another Jesus. They can be faithful to Buddha. They can be faithful to Krishna, whatever. You know, the general rules are the same, but the only thing that saves you, that says you're safe, is if the evidence of your faith is a faithfulness that is faithfulness to Jesus. And what did John say? 
if we're going to be sure that we're in him, then we ought to be just like him. What would that look like? Someone faithful to Jesus will end up reflecting him, won't they? Being just like him. That's what John's saying. In English, though, because we have different words for faith and faithfulness, when you come to translate this passage, the translators get there and then sometimes they put faith and sometimes they put faithfulness and commentators will generally say it's because they're trying to work out which one they meant in the original language, but they're all getting it wrong. They always mean both. They never mean one or the other because in both cultures, they're inseparable. I don't want to harp on too much, but it's so important. Is anyone not clear on that? So they always mean faith. So from now on, when you're reading in English, if you come across the word faith, or you come across the word faithful, from now on, you'll know that what God means is both always. Faith and faithfulness, the two cannot be separated in God's view of things. Does that make sense? Because for the translator in English, we don't have a single word. So they always have to like pick one that they think is, you know. Stern who did this uses the word trust. Trust, yeah. yeah. Is it interesting? Yeah. So is this making sense? Because it changes the color of everything when you understand it how he meant and what's this business of faith coming by akeo hearing well who like to read where's grace oh did grace run away where is she grace come back uh how about abby can you read us romans 10 on page three Okay, so if you just look at the next bit under there, thanks, Abby. Faith, pistis, being fully convinced. And also meaning convinced to the point where you decide to be faithful, only comes from what? Hearing. What? The rima, the word. Why would it be hearing not seeing yes and we'll look at this more in a second it's really specific it's always hearing and it's hearing the the rima so in the context it doesn't mean any word it means the word okay now back up in romans it says how can anyone preach unless they are sent well, anyone could preach, isn't it? Why does he say, how can anyone preach unless they are sent? You, Wayne might know what that word, I, I haven't checked it, but probably, at a guess, someone who's sent in the Greek is apostolos, from which you get the word apostle, right? The apostles, those who are sent, sent by who? Well, at one level, it's sent by the elders of the church, right? But ultimately, it's sent by who? Jesus. Jesus himself. They are his apostles. He sends them. And if he sends them... Yeah, but if he sends them, are they sent on their own? No, because they're sent to convince someone, isn't it? Because the hearing from them, if they've really been sent, says they have to be sent. If they're not sent nothing's happening but if someone's really sent by him and they 
allow you to hear the rima, the word, that is what can produce biblical faith, to become fully convinced, right? Now I want to ask you something, a simple question that will help you understand this. Were you there when Jesus rose from the dead? But do you believe that he rose from the dead? How much do you believe it? Are you fully convinced? Yes. So you have pithio to be fully convinced, which is the root word that you get pistis from, faith, okay? How can you be so certain when you read about it or someone told you about it? How can you be so certain that no one could unconvince you like you are that he rose from the dead? Well, it goes back to the Torah. To establish a truth about any matter, you need what? At minimum of two, better three witnesses. Okay, so when you first heard about Jesus being raised from the dead and you believed it like this, there had to have been two witnesses at least, better three. How many witnesses were there? You could think of your own case, well, we could think of the general case. The first witness is the rema itself, the word. Okay, so the scripture, witness number one. The second witness is most likely not always there because you could have just been reading this alone in your bedroom. But more usually, that third is the one is actually the third witness, might be what? Another human being, an evangelist, a preacher, your Christian friend, somebody through whom the Rima was delivered. So the Rima itself the word, the third witness, another person oftentimes, but not necessarily. Who's the second witness that's absolutely critical? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Okay. How do you know the Holy Spirit's there? Because this only happens when the apostle bringing the word is sent. It's Remember what we talked about, that you can't be saved, you can't become the bride unless the father sends his servant to get you. You can't come to biblical faith without the rema, the word, and the spirit there who brings the conviction of the authority of the word inwardly and if you like supernaturally turns the lights on. You know? You might have heard that a thousand times, you know, on the on the Easter movie or something, you know, or your Christian friend blathering on about something that you never quite understood. But suddenly, when this condition is there, when you're hearing it because the way you're hearing it has been sent to you, because it's for you, and the Spirit's there testifying with the Word, something special happens, which we'll look at again in a second. So now, we understand that to have faithfulness, you first need faith. You can't have right action without right belief, right? And you can't obtain right belief unless you hear the word. And that word has to be sent because you need the witness of the Spirit there for you to believe it, to believe things and and coming back to what our sister was saying before, if you had to see it to believe it, what's the first obvious problem with that? How will you see that he was raised from the dead? You were not there. You know? And we know that in the last days, the Antichrist will do all manner of signs and wonders in order to convince him of the lie, right? Seeing is not reliable. One, one in, the, in the Islamic world, um, Jesus does appear in visions and dreams to Muslims. Oh, yeah. Um, and it's quite very powerful. Yeah. And There's lots of Muslims getting saved right now, just as Wayne says, and, and God is meeting them in their sleep. And they're waking up in a sweat with the absolute pistis, fully convinced faith that that Jesus guy is actually the Messiah. A bit awkward for them of course but nevertheless that's happening so you understand for the spirit to be there and for the rema to have to have been sent what had to have happened first grace 
it only happens when God is the author of it him saving us never us saving ourselves never us saving our neighbor you understand so that's the first half let's look at what they contrast it to in the next oh one thing we'll just zoom over quickly on the top of page four to do with the work of the Holy Spirit how suddenly turns the lights on if you look at the example in Luke 24 he, he said to them this is what I told you while I was still with you everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses the prophets and the Psalms then in verse 45 then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scripture that is what only God can do that is what the witness the conviction of the Holy Spirit does other people can be hearing the same word with their ears but they don't hear it inwardly without the second witness without that God unblocks their ears unhardens their hearts unblinds their eyes they can be hearing exactly the same words audibly speaking but they're only hearing it in their ear you know and if you look down at our friends in the book of Daniel Meshach, Shadrach and company look what God does with them these four men God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds their ability to understand Daniel's ability to interpret where did it come from it says it was given to them it's they were not what's the word I'm looking for Wayne it's not of their own nature you know they weren't born that way it says he gave them when they're in Babylon he gave them these abilities why because it was equipping them to stand out because he was going to they were going to represent him even in Babylon so this all through the scripture you find us God has to be there by his spirit to make possible that is what is not possible for a human being by themselves you understand so what's the first thing we can say is salvation by grace absolutely because it's impossible unless God begins it and is the author of it and the power in it you can talk the Bible at someone all day long if God's not in that it's just words to them you need the two witnesses better three the word itself the spirit and if you're involved you're the third witness okay but if the other two aren't there nothing's happening let's look at the other one that's contrasted then so firstly we talked about hearing faith through hearing the other one that they contrast it with is the works of the law what are the works of the law well the first thing to know is it's not a different word than we saw before it's still ergon work work or works but here he's been really specific it's not just any works it says works of the law what law is he talking about Roman law what law God's law right mosaic law in actual fact the problem he was dealing with it wasn't limited to mosaic law the problem in the church was who the Pharisees again the pressure from those who were afraid of the Sanhedrin they were trying to have a bob each way it's an old saying so so as to yeah yeah so so as to not upset the Sanhedrin they were trying to keep have their the faith they'd received through hearing through grace the thing we just talked about but they were also trying to be justified in the sight of the Sanhedrin by continuing with the temple ritual not just the things prescribed in the Torah all the other stuff that the Pharisees had added remember what Jesus had to say about the Pharisees you know your your rules about rules made up by men 
because they added heaps of stuff themselves, traditions. What's, a, what's the most obvious modern example of that in action? Where they go beyond scripture and weigh people down with a million tons of tradition that's not in the Bible. Less people will understand that. What's the most common one that people, in, especially Filipinos, will understand? Catholic. So if you're, a, if you're an Orthodox Catholic, you'll have the scripture, and next to it, you'll have what? Well, we just call it tradition. So this is God said, and God said, and this is the Pope said. What's the problem? They say that they're on an even footing. That's what's wrong with the Catholic Church. So they, if the Pope issues like a, what's called a papal bull, right, then if you're a good Catholic, you are required to treat that with the same weight as Scripture. Well, that's what the Pharisees were doing. That's what Jesus was ripping them to pieces about. You weigh down the people with things that you've made up yourself. You know, you bind them in all this regulation and everything that didn't come from God. Its source was the priests. All this, you know, the, the Catholic way of doing things is the modern continuance of that. Okay, so how are you supposed to deal with tradition? Is this absolutely wrong? No, nothing wrong with the odd tradition. Well, but what's wrong with it is when you have it on the even footing. That's the sin. So if you want your priest to wear a funny hat, okay. But if you then say, unless he's got his funny hat on, he can't pray for someone, now you're in trouble. You understand the difference? There's tradition that's just tradition. It's not going to carry any weight. It's just tradition. No problem with that. Yeah, but, you know, so in essence, God is not so anally retentive that he can't handle, you know, a bit of culture or whatever. That's not the issue. The issue is where the things of man have been elevated as if they were from him. That's when God is angry. Okay? So, the works of the law isn't just the actual scripture. It's like this. It's all the junk that Jesus was trying to free them from. Everything that the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees had weighed the people down and tangled them up in. People who had been justified you know salvation had started were suddenly going back and getting themselves entangled again with what they were just minutes ago escaping from usually out of fear of the priests you know trying to as i said having a bob each way that's an old say but it's like trying to please both sides you really want to please god but you're a bit scared of the priest so you sort of you know can't have it you can't have both you must be one or the other to help you understand how this works remember when we looked at this word ergon how i said it isn't just any work it's work intended to accomplish the desire that's in you right so it's about heart attitude the attitude of your heart determines the kind of work you do so if your attitude is to be like Christ the kind of work that will result is faithfulness right the works of the law is a way of saying the attitude of your heart is not to be Christ like it's to be lawful according to the Pharisees to please the church well you know to please the Sanhedrin as opposed to pleasing Christ because you can't be both because Jesus is violently opposed to the Sanhedrin so you can't please both you know that's what all of these epistles are warning you can't have a foot in each camp you just end up some sort of weird schizophrenic standing for neither you cannot be in right relationship with God by being motivated to just please the church or the priests or the ritual law because if you are motivated to do that by default you are not motivated 
to please Jesus because Jesus is wildly opposed to those things. Heart, motivation, work results, the kind of work you do results from the desire in you. So works of the law means works designed to satisfy ritual, tradition, things that cannot save you. Is this making sense? It therefore does not mean, and this is the biggie, it does not mean that doing work is opposed to faith, which is what they try and make it mean. It's specific works of the law, not ergon generally. Paul is warning about the kind of work that's a mistake, not work being a mistake. Because remember what John just finished teaching us and James? If you don't have the works that go with biblical faith, your biblical faith is a myth. You have to have works, that's what we call faithfulness the action that results from biblical faith. If there's no works, there's no evidence of faith. You see, the mistake the church makes is thinking that Galatians and others are forbidding that you obey, that you make effort, that you choose deliberately to do things in obedience. They make that a bad thing, as if by doing so, you're not having enough faith. None of the apostles agree with that. On the contrary, John says if you go that way, you are deceiving yourself and are lost. The warnings in here and elsewhere are all specific to works of the law, where your motivation is not to be Christ-like, where your motivation is to please the earthly thing, the organisation, the priests, your parents, you know, whatever. Because you can't be both. You have to decide whose disciple you are. Because who you're wanting to please will dictate the works that result. Does that make sense? Let's go on. When you read this back yourself, there's a bit more, but you'll pick it up real easy. And remember, just as faith by hearing the author associated with the spirit here in the contrasting works of the law is associated with what the flesh remember remember how we've got two things going on the poetry thing where it's repeated but also it's using that midrash where the contrast so it's not this it's this so by understanding one helps you to understand the other so we so we first looked at uh, one sec, Pete. So we first looked at one side, the good one, faith through hearing the word, what, how it's supposed to be. Now we're looking at the other side. If you are motivated by trying to satisfy the earthly thing, and the writer associates that with pleasing the flesh. Pete, sorry. I was just basically going to say that to, to do works in the flesh is to do things to please yourself. Yeah. To do works in the spirit is to do things to please God. Yep, brilliant. Add that to your thinking because that's that's being on. So let's have a look at Galatians 5. And I'll just read this one out. And let's look at this whole business of the flesh, right? Because this is what the writer associates with people who are trying to be justified by works of the law you know the the wrong side that he's trying to emphasize yeah let's see what this flesh business is about so in galatians 5 you read you my brothers and sisters are called to be free is that true but doesn't it matter what free means and this is what he's about to talk about but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. And that's specifically agape. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you'll be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, capital S. So that's the Holy Spirit. 
and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. Let's pause there a second. Remember how I said that the writer is deliberately doing this contrast thing? You know, you can't have it both ways. It should be this, not this. That's why he's setting up the contrast so you can more clearly see this is what you want, this is what you don't want. Okay? In Galatians, he just comes out and blatantly says it. The two are in conflict with each other. The flesh and the spirit are at war in you. Right? But you can't be neutral. That's what he's saying. You can't be Switzerland. You have to take sides. You know, you can't have it both ways. You are either led by the Spirit, your desire is to be Christ-like, everything John was telling us, or you're not. If you are not one, you will be the other. If you don't, if you are not motivated to be Christ-like, you will be fleshy. There's no neutral ground. The two war against each other in you, and if one, if the good doesn't prevail, the other will. Now, let's go on there. You are not to do whatever you want. So what's the first thing that freedom in Christ doesn't mean? Pete said it. Did you get that? You're called to be free. Those whom, uh, those whom the Son sets free are what? Free indeed okay but you are not free to do whatever you like your freedom is not that kind of freedom so what free are you free from do. yes perfect answer did everyone get that before you have grace when you don't have the holy spirit what choice do you have about sinning none you think you have free will but actually you don't you are enslaved to sin Whatever you think you're doing with your free will, it will result in sin. Because the only choices your enslaved mind knows is which sin it, it's going to have next. Right? You are a slave. You're not free. When Christ frees you, you get the first time genuine free will. And I remember it this way. I call it freed will. Your will is set free. You are for the first time able to actually make a decision to not sin. You know, you are empowered by the Holy Spirit to make right choices. He doesn't make them for you. You still have to make them, you know. But for the first time, you have the power of the Holy Spirit empowering you to be able to obey, which an unsaved person does not have. An unsaved person cannot obey God because they are enslaved to their sinful nature. A born-again person has been freed, enabling them to make the right choices. Does that make sense? A freed will. Now, this is my whole point. So the Holy Spirit doesn't force you to make the right choices. He enables you for the first time. The choice. Genuine choice. An unsaved person has no choice but to sin. Which is why we give them what God gave us, his Torah, yeah. to, to tell us what the right choice is to make. Yeah, so God, the law and the testimony tell you, based on his sham, he's revealing his character to you, so that you know what the right choices are, the things that please him. You understand? But unless you have the spirit, you can't make right choices. You are just enslaved to your sinful nature. We are not to use our freedom to do what we like. Why? Because what do you think you like? You know, let's face it, when you go grocery shopping and if you just have five dollars and there's a banana and an ice cream, <laughs> you know, it all depends on whether the wife is watching. <laughs> and that's exactly how it is with God being conscious of God. We want the ice cream. Your old nature doesn't lie down. 
You want the ice cream. But being conscious that God is watching. You, if you want, if your desire is to be Christ-like, to be his disciple, you crucify the want in order to do the better thing. Does that make sense? Which you are able to do because you have the Spirit. If you weren't a Christian, that whole, that whole process wouldn't even arise. You would just be eating the ice cream because your nature would just drive you to the ice cream. You understand? Bit of an odd analogy, but I thought it was easy to follow. Where are we now? Get my right page. Ah, sorry. And then verse 18. And Davina hit this one on the nail on the head before. But what? What's that I put in the big letters there? But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. How many people will always, if you bring up the subject of obedience, you know, like deliberately choosing to make right choices, they'll say, oh, you're being legalistic. We're not under the law anymore. Actually, that's not true. That is not true. If you're in church and you're religious, you can be under the law still. Why? What does it just say here? Read it again, verse 18. If you are led by the Spirit, then... You are not under the law. What does that mean? If the motivation in your heart, though you claim to be a Christian and though you're sitting in church and though you're telling everyone around you, I'm a Christian, but if what drives you, what determines the work, is to satisfy earthly things, you are not motivated to satisfy heavenly things. You are not led by the spirit the things jesus accomplishes for his disciples are not presently fully applying to you why because you are walking in the dark you are not being his disciple at that time you understand the to be able to say i'm no longer under the law even though i know we can argue we've never been under the law before being gentile but for the sake of argument it's conditional the only people who are freed from the curse of the law are those who are in the new covenant. They are living according to the commands of Christ. If you're not motivated to be Christ-like, to be obedient to him, if your goal is not him, you've got a problem. So again, the churches tell people something that's actually not true. And they leave them enslaved thinking that they can do as they like and yet claim I'm not under the law, I'm free, I'm this, I'm everything else. They should read Galatians. They've been warned in plain language. Your freedom is not that you could do what you like. You, may, you know Dan, eh? Dan? Most, remember Dan telling me almost in tears he visited a rise church. And he watched them all jumping up and down and they're having a little rock concert or whatever. What really broke his heart though is when he saw them all down um, Cuba Street after church all falling out of the pubs drunk. Well, you know, they're just exactly like, behaving exactly like everyone else at the pub after church. What were they using their freedom for? To just... They just thought they were free to do anything because I'm a king's kid, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, nothing can touch me, blah, 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 blah. But what, what is it that's driving their actions? Not a desire to please Christ, not a desire to be set apart as a holy people, you know? What motivates them is just to satisfy whatever their flesh wants. And according to the scripture, that means they are, what? Self-deceived. They are not in the covenant, Pete. Sorry, this just keeps coming back into my mind, and it may be off track, but I don't think it is. What's the second commandment? When you say in the, of the Ten Commandments, the commandment of the Ten Commandments. you shall have no idols. No, yeah, no idols. Okay. Do you know the biggest idol that we have a problem with? Ourselves. Self, yep. We sit on the throne. Yep. We used to talk about turning Jesus into a vending machine when when the problem the big problem we were wrestling with was the the blab it and grab it crew you know name it and claim it 
So whatever you ask in my name, I'll, I'll give you. So they would claim this, and in the name of Jesus, I claim this, and I claim the other thing. So what they're doing, actually, is they were reducing him to like one of those vending machines. So whenever I need something, that's when I go to him. You know, and I've got a magic formula, which is like putting my coin in the slot, pull the handle, and pop, out comes what I want. And then I go again till I want something else. And that's what the prosperity churches are all about. They just reduce the creator of all created things, the God of gods, to a vending machine that they only visit when they want something. <laughs> but you know, so because in their minds, they, what they want, is more important than what he wants. That's what Pete's talking about. They become bigger on the throne than Jesus. Jesus gets reduced to the fix-it man or the butler or the, you know? <coughs> no. <laughs> no. Is this getting through? Oh, I hope so. Let's see what he says the acts of the flesh are like. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. Well, you can memorize that list, but then it says and the like, so it's not an exhaustive list, okay? Here's how to remember it. Remember we talked about his shem? <laughs> So everything that is inconsistent with his character is the flesh. Can you imagine Jesus participating in any of that? No. So it's easy, isn't it? And you used to say, to like Sunday school, if you want to know what to do, ask yourself, what would Jesus do if he was in it instead of me? Well, that's what you say to Sunday school kids, but actually it's like really wise. Yeah, yeah. Do you understand? So if you want to know what the flesh is, it's the it's the opposite of his shem. It's the things you couldn't imagine Jesus doing that are contrary to him. And contrary to his purpose in your life. What's his purpose in your life? To free you from being a slave to sin. To sanctify you. To present you to his Father holy, without blemish, without spot, a bride fit for God. So the motivations that take you in a different direction is the flesh, including those dramatic things on that list. Now for more positive news, same scripture, but the fruit of the Spirit is, let's read them out together, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, specifically agape. So that's the one that's to do with obedience rather than feelings. Joy, peace, forbearance. What does forbearance mean? For those whose English isn't super good. That's perseverance. Forbearance is what? A willingness to be patient with those who are messing up. In other words, reflecting his patience with me. To forbear means to delay punishment in the hope that the person will come right and you won't have to punish them. To forbear. Carry on. Kindness. Goodness. Oh, what does it say next? Faithfulness gentleness and self-control ecrete self-control against such things there is no law those who belong to christ have done what crucified the flesh with its passions and desires since we live by the holy spirit let us keep in step with the spirit let us not become conceited provoking and envying each other what does crucifying the flesh mean <coughs> what happens when you crucify something you kill it what does jesus say i'm pretty sure i wrote this somewhere along i'll probably come to it in a minute but let's say it now if anyone would follow me they must they must take up their own cross but if anyone will not take up their own cross they are not worthy of me you cannot be his disciple unless you've got your own cross what do you need a cross for that how does your fleshiness get on the cross you have to nail it there it's an active participation in your sanctification you are not trying to save yourself by works 
you are not trying to be self-righteous that's what the grace only people want to try and make it mean no you are cooperating with his desire to sanctify you you have a freed will that allows you when you reach it like a decision point like a fork in the road and it's like well, you know like in the movies where there's a little angel on this shoulder and a little devil on this shoulder going you know buy the ice cream buy the banana you know you have to decide because your old nature and your new nature is what those things represent and you'll be getting it in both ears your whole life slightly older youth in the room like us is that true has that stopped happening are you have you ceased to be tempted by your old nature now that you're slightly older no it continues but remember what john says we have an obligation to him to be like him so we are in this constant wrestling match where we have been given a freed will and the choice is really ours prompted by the holy spirit led by the holy spirit and empowered by the holy spirit and guess what happens when you make the right choice does god back it yes who's heard about oh well you've all been to church in the philippines so everyone likes to talk about being victorious in christ and that comes from the scripture right being victorious in christ what does it mean though scripturally what is the victory overcome yeah have you did it never occur to you when you're sitting in like oh, i'm not saying you've all been in that but i know you've all heard that stuff but has it not occurred to you that christ won the victory on the cross right so why are we called to seek the victory if if he's already victorious what victory are we seeking well we are seeking to be like him with his help which makes it possible which was otherwise impossible remember it's him saving us we are supposed to be actively seeking victory over the flesh not on your christian deck chair thinking i'm all right i'm going to heaven doesn't matter how i live jesus will just forgive me all is well that is a complete and utter lie but millions of christians have been fed that lie and they absolutely believe it but the scripture is absolutely not saying that real victory is continuing discipleship remaining actively engaged in your own sanctification we have choice and you use it knowing that he will he will back you up when you make christ-like choices what happens if you mess up what happens when you mess up john we talked about this i think two weeks ago we repent remember if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us and do what cleanse us of all unrighteousness this is not about being perfect this is not about trying to justify yourself by being walking a sinless life it's about having that attitude god calls for the one that is not content to live in the flesh you understand you will never be christ-like in this life but you can cease to be world-like you're already not like the world but you're not fully the reflection of christ yet you won't be till heaven you're already a new creation so you will always as long as you're breathing you will always fall short at some point so let's get that clear so this is not what god is saying that you that unless you are perfectly like jesus you're not saved he's saying your attitude the one he's looking for is the one who is motivated to be christ-like who seeks to obey and when they mess up they come and say lord i messed up forgive me and cleanse me of this and help me get up again because when you fall down what do you do you pick your cross up and you go again and you go again and you go again as long as you breathe that is a disciple okay it's a bit more there on page five you can read for yourself what do we need to do here um, read that bit for yourself i just want to skip out because it's eight i want to skip over the things that you can easily pick up for yourself okay so 
on page 6 you'll see Matthew 16 which is what we just talked about so you can read that and then under it Matthew 23 and he's speaking to the Pharisees so you also outwardly appear righteous to others but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness what is the problem that he's pointing out to them do the Pharisees have faith in the God of the Bible do they know the scripture yes, yes. Do they teach the scripture? I thought I was back in Dangansora for a minute. Sorry. I didn't even know that was there. <laughs> yeah. What? So the problem with the Pharisees, the problem with the Pharisees is not that they don't believe in God. It's not it's not that they don't know the scripture it's not that they don't teach the scripture because they did what was their problem you just ran it there they were only christian well we'll say christian because that's the pharisees but it applies to us so let's say it's someone who's only christian in appearance they know the words you know they can quote the scripture so in a sense they they can tell you things that are true you know so they have belief that is true what's missing they're not faithful they appear one thing but inwardly they are something else and this is the danger of not understanding what John is trying to say what Paul's trying to say what Pete's oh, what Pete's trying to say yeah Pete you want to with your lips are far from me that's right that's what he said to the pharisees so just having pistis faith belief is not enough the pharisees had that but their actions the faithfulness that you know what people saw what people experienced the the evidence of what the faith was didn't line up with what they said you know and that's what he says to them you say one thing but you don't do it do you understand it so what does it mean for us it's not enough to know who Jesus is it's not enough to even believe what he said it's not enough is it to even be able to tell these things to other people because it's all in vain unless one thing is there what's that your faith has to be matched by your faithfulness you mustn't be a hypocrite your actions ought to reflect that your faith is real otherwise you're someone who knows about Jesus but doesn't know Jesus because if you knew him you would do what he said does this make sense and I'm not going to read the, the rest is easy reading but I'm just going to finish the last page and a half there just quickly without the what you'll read there in 2 Thessalonians and a couple other things what's the biggest danger probably for us maybe even in our lifetime but certainly in our near future who's coming that you don't really want to fall in the clutches of the Antichrist right and what is in 2 Thessalonians he's given a title the man of lawlessness right <laughs> lawlessness what do you think lawlessness means well you could say it means without law but what is let, let's just go to like ordinary english if there was a lawless person in our community what would we, what's an easy word to call that someone who doesn't keep the law so it's not that they don't know the law it's about what they do a man of lawlessness is someone who doesn't do what is lawful it's not about knowing it's not about belief do you think the antichrist knows the scripture you bet why because he's part of the unholy trinity i'm not sure if you understand that what happens in the end is you get a satanic mimic of the trinity so you get an antichrist spirit mimicking the holy spirit you get an antichrist mimicking christ and satan acts mimicking the father so you get an unholy trinity mimicking the real trinity right 
the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, do you think he knows the law? Yeah, the whole of God's law. Because remember, nothing Jesus, nothing, nothing Jesus says is not in the Torah. Nothing Jesus teaches is not already in the Torah. Yeah, yeah, there's nothing new in the New Testament. Nothing. So when we talk about the law, we're talking about God's instruction to man. Okay? So just like Satan in the garden, he won't give you a completely different thing. He'll just twist what God said. So you can be sure that the Antichrist... Oh, when Jesus is tempted in the wilderness, what did Satan use to tempt him? The word of the Lord. Twisted. So the man of lawlessness, you can be sure he knows the law. He knows what Jesus said. He knows Jesus face to face because he's stood at the throne room of God. He knows Jesus better than us, right? But he doesn't do it. And he leads people into also not doing it. What do you think becomes the critical separation between the disciples and those who take the mark of the beast? It's not faith, as in belief. It's faithfulness. The people that take the, that go off with him will still believe that Jesus is the Messiah. The problem is they'll believe that this guy is Jesus. Though they won't be trying to live to satisfy Christ, they'll be still trying to satisfy the flesh. What kind of message do you think the man of lawlessness will be giving them? The one you just heard here? No. It'll be, no, 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 don't listen to those legalistic people. You are saved. Doesn't matter what you do, Jesus will just save you. God doesn't mind that you're doing this, that or the other thing. Go ahead. So it sounds like God speaking, but the message is not God's message. And it will lead people to believe that they are safe and secure in the flesh the holy spirit will always convict you to obey christ and to put the flesh to death always the antichrist will come and do the opposite and that's what will separate the sheep from the goats so what is the most dangerous thing in the church it's this idea that what you do doesn't count that faithfulness doesn't mean anything you know because it's all of jesus and none of me and things like that that is scriptural nonsense yes you can't be saved without him it's him saving us so how do you explain to someone including yourself if he's saving me what is my response doing then if i can't be saved apart from him that's true how is my obedience saving me what if what is that actually Your cooperation with it's cooperation and we're definitely ending on this you'll find it written in here in a few earlier pages do you remember how the whole gospel is a wedding contract right and i apologize because you have to get faith to explain to you because you won't have heard this but remember you're only betrothed right the wedding's not till the kingdom you're only betrothed so you are in a betrothal contract in which all the terms for the wedding to come and the marriage are set out and what we call that wedding contract is the Brita Hadashah the renewed covenant a covenant is a contract okay it's a wedding contract and as you know once the betrothal is in place what does the groom do in the Hebrew setting what does the groom do he goes away to his father's house to prepare it what did jesus do he says i have to go if i don't go you can't come i have to go and prepare a place for you he's just speaking hebrew wedding language okay what's the bride supposed to do while he's away she has to change herself as far as it's up to her to become that bride that he's hoping she'll be that's your sanctification and remember once they're married can they be divorced no but can the engagement contract be cancelled yes how if the bride 
or the groom continually and seriously breach the terms of the contract. In other words, if they leave the contract. If they leave it and won't come back, the contract is over. Will the groom in this case breach the contract? No chance because it, he's God. So we don't have to worry about the groom breaching the contract. The only place it can all go upside down is if the betrothed bride leaves the contract. That's us. How do you leave the contract? You stop being faithful. And he will try and bring you back, correct you in it. But if you insist on going your own way and you are not motivated by wanting to be faithful, in the end, the world and the flesh will lure you away right out of the contract and you'll end up like the bulk of the church. And what does the scripture say happens to the church before Antichrist comes? You'll read it in Thessalonians there at the bottom of the page. Before he comes, there has to be a great falling away. Most of the church will abandon Jesus. That's what the prophets have said. That's what Paul says. What will that look like? Their faithfulness will evaporate. They'll still believe in him, but they won't do what he says. They will no longer be faithful. They'll be running after what their flesh wants. So what will you do? And can you do it on your own? I bet no. That's why we have to fellowship. Because we need each other's support and encouragement to choose his way and to be faithful in it. Because if you try walking that road alone, it's very, very hard. That's why God calls us into fellowship for each other's support. Okay, so there's a little bit more you can read in there. But I hope that will have inoculated you or made you immune, hopefully, from listening to the watered down rubbish. And it sounds in the churches like the pastors are just being lazy, but the spirit that's motivating them is the Antichrist spirit. It is trying to get you to abandon even the idea that faithfulness would even mean anything. Don't be taken in. Okay, so with that in mind, um, if you have any questions, ask me after. Otherwise, did you just nod? I agree. Faith will, ah, uh, faith. Grace will. Oh, we can't have faith without grace first. So, <laughs> so we could have faith followed by grace, or grace followed by faith, or yeah. So the two of you can pray us out. Grace followed by faith. Yep. So you can pray us closed, you and then you. Amen. Amen. Double amen.